Charles, did you turn this up in my headphones? You know I'm I think you got it on your headphones. Oh, yeah. Yes. All right, everybody. This is very exciting. We're back. This is did the you Friends miss us? Talking Fantasy Podcast. Did you miss us? That's a great question. I hope you did. We missed you. Well, I did anyway. Same. It's in a very exciting day today. We have finished reading uh, Mistborn, the first book in the series, which they call Mistborn, the, final the Final Empire. Empire. That's right. We finished reading it, and today is the day that we are going to discuss it in depth. We have a lot of exciting conversations planned for today. And uh, before we do any of that, Marsh, just how, how, how you doing? How's your weekend going? Oh, yeah, it is the weekend. Good point, Charles. Yeah, it is the weekend. Uh, it's going well. I I finished Malazan recently, wow. which was You you texted nice. me Malazan, that. Malazan, not, was, yeah, the second book. This I was impressed. I was like, good for you, because we were reading this. You were also reading Malazan. Is, I'm very impressed with your work. Good job. Thank you. Yeah, so that's... <laughs> Dead House Gates I finished, and I finished Mistborn earlier today. That was nice. Um, non, Non-fantasy non stuff. I had, had a nice conversation with a, a friend today. And oh, like a cool. Zoom conversation? Know. Phone call. We kicked oh, it old school. That, yeah. Wow, that is OG. And I have a few friends that I like will do the phone call with it always feels like a different it's like i'm not used to having the phone like on my <laughs> head it's, it's a weird feeling i'm but it's always nice to that, that little personal touch for whatever reason when i'm on a phone call i just start pacing yeah, yeah me too you too <laughs> Yeah, definitely. <laughs> i mean you gotta there's gotta be a psychology reason behind why we do that marsh no, I don't know it. <laughs> I All did right. start pacing today. Uh, my pacing story is not done, Charles. And <laughs> Tell me all about people it. People need to know. You paced around the halls, uh, around the room. Did you like step uh, outside the apartment? I think it's nice that you think my apartment has holes. <laughs> <laughs> it has a hall. Yeah, it does have one hall. It's pretty short. I... I just want to say I got my steps up. I That's like to good. know how many steps I take every day, and this really helped. You know, last week after we recorded episode one, I was listening to it. I was, like, pacing as I was listening to it, which I thought was kind of interesting. But I was all kind of jazzed, and I was just kind of walking around, picking stuff up around the apartment, listening to it, taking notes. Was it? an excited energy or a nervous it energy was, it was an excited energy but it was also just like i felt i was hearing people talk and i felt the urge to pace like i do on a, on a phone call hmm. so what's how's your weekend man? charles it's good man uh can't complain pretty lazy um while you're reading miles on i'm reading uh the witcher series i'm like three books into it I mean, into the actual series. There's two standalones, but I read mm. those, and then I'm like three books into the into the series itself, and it's good. It's kind of losing steam for me. Like I like the standalones a lot because they were just a bunch of short stories, which was great for my commute into my my real job. Um, so those were always fun, and the main character Geralt is obviously the best character. So when you try and expand it. It can, and you start, it's a whole scene with a bunch of characters that aren't Geralt. You're like, what is even the point of all this? But I was also playing the video game Witcher 3, which was excellent too. So it's a very very Witcher weekend. So I can't complain. Yeah. I wish we had. I'm I'm not done with my story, Marsh. Uh, That was just my fantasy related stuff. We need more. This was the non fantasy stuff now that I'm talking about. Uh, Non-fantasy stuff, I'm having some family over tomorrow, and we're just going to grill. And I've been craving hot dogs. Like, 
hot dogs aren't something I eat normally. I'll just go months without them. But then one day, I just like really start to crave a hot dog. So I'm just like in the hot dog phase right now. So I'm excited for tomorrow to be eating hot dogs. Friends talking fantasy coming at you with the uh, hot takes. The, <laughs> the hottest takes about pacing and hot dogs. Yeah, let's please end this for everyone and get to their get to the fantasy portion of the show. Yeah. That was the so, friends talking portion. Yeah, we got that out of the way. So thank <laughs> if you're still here, thank you for sticking with us. And as promised, we will now be doing the fantasy portion of the show. Uh, so, Mistborn, the, the final empire. Uh, I, I guess, Marsh, do you want to kick it off? I know you had an interesting kind of retrospective. This is our second time each. We have both read it once before, many years ago, but now we kind of are having this kind of retrospective, the reread, so that we can be informed and, and have an in-depth discussion. I do. I have fond memories of when I read this book because it takes me back to... You remember when we did that trip? It, it actually started, I think, with you. This was when I was down in Boca Raton in South Florida. And you were in New Orleans. Yeah. Neither of us are in those places anymore. <laughs> no. And you you came down to visit me in Boca Raton. Then we went up to where your parents were at in, in North Florida and then or maybe west florida what's they're what's pretty south there? yeah they're, they're pretty south they're southwest so we just went southwest. from one coast to the other yes and then we went up and west to new orleans after That's that right. and we we drove there and it was you me and your brother chris who's getting a second right. shout out on the show and mm-hmm. we Drove to New Orleans, and on the way there, we had the three of us, so we were just messing around, doing whatever. And then stayed in New Orleans, and then, you know, we were trying to have a good time. And we had a few drinks most nights, but on the nights where I was not too drunk, I would read some <laughs> Mistborn on I mean, we were Kindle. in New Orleans, you know, this was a celebratory moment, because... This was, but this wasn't your. This was like your second time visiting me in New Orleans, right? Or, it was like my third. The third time, right? So I, yeah. that was man. You visited me a lot in those days. I did. Such a, such a good friend, and now you haven't been to Atlanta once. I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic, Charles. Give me, <laughs> give me a break. Well, maybe we weren't, you know, a year ago when I moved here. But anyway, so yeah, those were good times. Lots of fun was had. Mm-hmm. And we, I want to get into the chicken wing story. <laughs> you want to get into that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, Lord. All right. Quickly. Okay. Well, this isn't Mistborn related, but while <laughs> during the time I was reading Mistborn was when I was staying there and it came up that I, I was saying, well, my friends could eat a lot of chicken wings. I, I said something like 30 or something like that. And somehow we got to the point where you and I made a bet I think it was that you said you could eat 50 chicken wings yes in one sitting to be fair it's the pieces of the wings like the flat and the drum individually that's two pieces so 50 pieces if you go to a place to get chicken wings like a hot wing place we're talking you're ordering 50 though yes and then we had that day we went to the world war ii museum and we it's a cool place yeah, it is a cool place and you didn't eat all day because the bet was that we were gonna buy wings i think for you me and i did Chris. i fasted for the whole day 24 hours yeah not even like from like the night before you know i was doing a whole 24 hour fasting situation and the bet was that I think Chris was going to get a free meal no matter what, so he beat it <laughs> off like a bandit. But the yeah. bet was that if you couldn't eat 50 chicken wings, then you would pay for the entire meal. And if you could, then I would pay we for We ordered the 100 meal. chicken yeah. wings with the idea that I was mm-hmm. going to eat 50, 
and then we're gonna <laughs> split the rest. <laughs> there was this place that made really good wings, and that you could buy like you know catering sizes of chicken wings. So I like, we placed an order like that morning. We were like, can we get a hundred chicken wings? And it came in one of those like catering trays. It was like a lot of wings. Yeah, and I have a picture of you with the wings. It was just the ones right that now. you were going to. <laughs> <laughs> just the ones that I made in my background on this Zoom call. <laughs> and it it was it was a pretty impressive performance that you put in. But yeah. uh, Charles, did you make it to fifty? Well, I'll I'll put everyone through what was going on in my mind, you know, the play by play, like a, like a boxer, you know, an MMA fighter. You know, I crushed twenty. Just absolutely <laughs> destroyed. Okay. I was feeling really good. Okay, another we go in another tent. We're at the 30 mark. I'm starting to get a little winded, okay? This is the point where I'm starting to feel some resistance. I'm getting about to 35, I think it was, somewhere in that range. And I knew that it just, like, I was pretty full. I could, like, hit that 40. But, man, from 40 to 50... I could just tell it was going to be like this impossible slog. So rather than like having you guys watching me and like <laughs> suffering to 42, 43, like not even coming close, like lucky to hit 40. I, I did the gentleman. I, what I feel was the gentlemanly noble thing. And I just put the wings down in like the low to mid thirties, like around 35 and I was just like, you know what, I could eat a few more, but it's just, I couldn't make it. You know, I foot the bill for the whole thing. There is nothing more dignified than a man putting down the chicken wings. I mean, I knew, 35 I knew of I had met my match, you know, I knew I met my match early on. Although I will say those were breaded. They were. I'm looking at the image right now. They were not just like plain wings. I think that would have made a difference. Would it have gotten me to 50? We can't say for sure, but it would have certainly gotten me close. Well, it was on your home turf and you chose the place. <laughs> I did choose the place. So I, I wish I had the forethought to maybe order grilled wings or something. But those wings were delicious, though. They're, they're so good. So I was happy. To those are great them wings. In. And I was happy to have the leftovers as well. So yeah. that's, did you even get to the Mistborn part of this yet? I did mention that I was <laughs> reading Mistborn during that trip. And and there's a lot more stories I will refrain from telling <laughs> on, on that trip, such as uh, Chris's night of debauchery. But <laughs> If this was Friends Talking Fantasy After Dark, then maybe. But Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> Okay, well, now let's get into the fantasy part. On my ride back, because we, we drove there, I was going to just drive back from New Orleans New Orleans to southeast Florida all That's by like myself. a 12-hour drive? Yeah, Nine it was 11 and, a, 11 and a half. Yeah. 11 and a half. Yeah. And drive. it's a long drive, and I was just about halfway through Mistborn when I started the drive. And then I just audiobooked the rest. So I pretty much had a 12 hour straight shot of listening to the Mistborn audiobook, which is very good, I think, by right. the way. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. So it's interesting because my first read was this straight shot through it. So I didn't really take the time to digest it much much like charles and his chicken wing situation <laughs> and oh they were digested <laughs> you didn't take your that. time <laughs> <laughs> and yeah then i it actually just made the ride fly by and i i look fondly back on that trip <laughs> back and it's actually i think giving me uh, rosy colored glasses for what it's like to take long drives and i keep telling myself oh i could i could easily do a long drive i could drive from colorado to florida if i wanted to but in my head i'm like oh just be like listening to mistborn straight through 
<laughs> right? If you just need to have good source material to get you through it, I would think. Mm-hmm. I have a similar, well, there's no chicken wings involved in the first time I listened to this. Uh, did I, had I already read, do you remember if I had already read Mistborn by the time you were reading it? You had. That's what I thought, because I read it really early on in my, like, modern fantasy exposure. I'm thinking it was when I was commuting. I was living in Long Island, and I was working in Manhattan, and I was commuting back and forth, and I would listen to it on the train. Uh, My commute was, like, three hours every day. It was one and a half hours each way, so I, like, got a really binge kind of... I, I got through it really quickly. But that must have been maybe five years ago. So mm. it's been it's been a long time since I've read it because it was audiobooks. I listened to it, um, so we it was interesting that we both got the audiobook experience. And I think those audiobooks are great. I mean, it's read by Michael Kramer, who's kind of like a a legend in the fantasy uh, audiobook narrator world. He's like one of the only people anyway. It's not that big of a world, but he did Wheel of Time also, which are also excellent, excellent audiobooks. So I remember being really into them and I always appreciated how like the action of it, how I always, even though I was half asleep most of the time, I was like engrossed in the story. And I just remember a kind of getting through those moments because i hated that commute with uh fiery <laughs> passion but i always looked forward to getting to put the earbuds back in and and get to conclude the story of mistborn so i listened to the whole trilogy in audiobook and it was a a great experience i mean on on the reread the book still flowed pretty quickly like i will say like getting to actually sit with the book and read it rather than going through the audiobook i was able to kind of be a little more critical of the story and the writing so i was able to develop a more of an appreciation of it kind of analyze it a little better like i I feel like the audiobook and that first time through i was just like along for the ride like watching a movie just having a great time and then the reread i was able to kind of go back and like take a look at each line kind of think about the themes a little bit more and Although I knew all the twists and turns, I was still surprised at how entertained I was, and I did get a lot of value out of out of um, being able to take a closer look at, at Sanderson's writing. I felt the same way that getting some space from it and being able to read it at a slower pace and really try to analyze it a little more. I, I got a different kind of appreciation than I got from being absorbed in it for a car ride. I would agree. And now that we've taken the time to read it and analyze it, I think it's finally time to talk about it. Um, before mm-hmm. we get too into it, um, I think we should just do a, a really brief kind of summary of of Mistborn, because I don't know if we've ever actually explained it. Um, Mistborn is a trilogy. We were talking about the first book today. It's Mistborn, The Final Empire. It's written by an author named Brandon Sanderson, who, in terms of like modern-day fantasy, is, is one of the more prolific authors, one of the more um, best-selling authors uh, of modern fantasy. We, we chose to read Mistborn because in our last discussion about gateway novels, we both had came to a disagreement that Mistborn is a great place to start for anyone who's kind of thinking about fantasy uh, but hasn't really dabbled in it too much because of its readability and of its great kind of magic system and the magic system in this book is there's a couple of them but the main one is called Allomancy where uh, uh, if it's a hereditary power that certain people can ingest metals and when they ingest them they can use them for powers and then there's some even rarer hereditary traits where someone can burn multiple metals at, at once and and they're called misborn so uh, i i think marsh you you have a really good understanding of kind of sanderson's philosophy and magic so i i think i'd want to turn it over to you and maybe explain kind of sanderson's um philosophy in terms of magic and how it relates to misborn specifically sure yeah well key to how brandon sanderson thinks about 
magic is his he has three laws of magic and the first law is only one we'll touch on briefly today which is that an author's ability to solve conflict with magic is directly proportional to how well the reader understands said magic and that pretty much gets at two ends of a continuum that are not necessarily that there's one better than the other or that there's one that's worse but uh if the reader doesn't understand the magic really well that's called a soft magic system and in that way magic gives you a sense of wonder uh, because you don't really know how it works it's like how more of the rings we don't really know unless you read all the background stuff to figure this out but just reading the first book you don't really know what gandalf can or can't do but also because you're low in uh, how well the reader understands that you also don't want to have him just solving all their problems using his magic and then on the opposite end of the continuum and uh, this is what mistborn is often the quintessential example of is hard magic where the rules are clearly delineated and the magic becomes a a tool in the character's tools kit so uh, same way that you're not upset if a character has a lock pick and then picks a lock you're not upset when there's uh, allomancy in mistborn used to solve problems because you know how it works right and one of the things i really like about sanderson's explanation in all this is from a reader's perspective like one of the things i like about sanderson so much is that when he approaches these magic systems and he, when he approaches these books that he's writing he he mentions right on his um in his article where he wrote about the first law he says um i write from the perspective of a writer because he wants to make sure that he's having fun writing it as the reader because at the end of the day it should be fun to read and then as a storyteller which i also thought was interesting because he wanted it to be narratively sound and have room for mystery and discovery and i don't think anyone in the game has as much of this kind of consideration for the reader as 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 sanderson does especially in this world of fantasy where things can get you know the author's creating this whole world and it can get so expansive and you can there's so many details and things can really get run away with and there's characters that have all kinds of crazy powers but sanderson always takes him into like okay what would kind of engage the reader and also what would create a great kind of sense of mystery a great sense of discovery and i think alamancy is a really great example of how you can take this hard magic system where it's almost like you would learn it in science class it's like there's these 10 metals and they can they're each kind of grouped into two like a push and a pull and you can and you can burn them and 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 like then there ends up it ends up expanding and as it expands you're kind of discovering it along with the main character who is who can burn all these metals it's really just a a really fascinating kind of exposure to the world of hard magic definitely should we get briefly into the premise of of the book charles yeah well i would say the book is kind of based on this idea i i I read sanderson's writing of how he kind of came up with the idea for mistborn and it was kind of built on two things one of them is kind of a spoiler so i don't know if we want to get into that but the first one was kind of this idea of making like a heist story Mm -hmm. like a story around a, a heist and have like a team of thieves which is all the main characters kind of have this background in, in thieves' guilds. Uh, but then they kind of join together to try and overthrow who's called the Lord Ruler. And he's like that. He's like a god king of the entire land. And he's kind of oppressing a whole group of people. And, and they're set out this like thieves' guild is setting out to kind of overthrow them. So that's kind of where this book is rooted in. And then there's the second thing, which is. Um, the I I don't want to get too far into it because it is I kind think, of spoilerly, but it's heroes. Well, this and... is this is for people who have listened to the or sorry, the, who have already read Mistborn. So I think okay. it's so fair game for us. I think to at just this point a... we can just say if you 
if you've gotten this far and you haven't read it, go read it. It's really good. But this concludes the spoiler-free version, and we're going to get into the um, the nitty-gritty of, of the ending right now, which is Sanderson's second thing that kind of inspired him to write this book after heists is this idea of the supposed hero, like what if he failed and someone who's not heroic takes over the spot and and ends up running the show it's kind of this idea of like the failed hero and that can i get into that a bit charles yeah, go I, for it so i i did a little diving into what you shared with me the other day which is that sanderson annotates chapters he and... annotates every single chapter it's insane yeah. so basically he just says hey here's what i was going for with this chapter or Here's what inspired me, whatever. And this is all just available, I believe, on his website. And I was reading about this premise in, I think, his chapter 38 that he wrote about it. And he said that uh, the concept was, what if the Dark Lord won? And he goes on to say, what if Frodo kept the ring was his original Uh. idea. And and maybe the more spoilery, spoilery way that it ended up going, Sanderson says that he eventually decided to twist that into what if Sam killed Frodo and took the ring and then became <laughs> a Dark Lord. So that's obviously riffing off Frodo and Sam from Lord of the Rings. And <laughs> That would be a then, very interesting story. Yeah, so I think, and even this is a little different than what ends up happening uh, you know, I, I wouldn't quite say that Rashik and Elendi are, are Sam and Frodo. No, <laughs> but it's the same idea of like you're led to believe that there's this hero of ages. Mm. Is, is that what they actually call him? Yeah. And then you find out in the twist right at the right in the third act there that um, he's not who you, you the Lord Ruler who you thought was the hero of ages the whole time ended up not being that he ended up being uh, a not good guy that was with the hero of ages at the time and betrayed him and took all the power. So, uh, which those were kind of like the whole book, maybe not so subtly kind of builds up to that reveal, which we can talk more about and when we get there, but I think it might be better to talk through some of these scenes and, and through the characters more in the order of, of this, of the story. Uh huh. And, and you go ahead. I think that also for those listening, we're assuming you've you've read the books by this point, so we're not going to give a, a summary of the. Yeah, you know, if you want a summary, at, just just go and like Google it and read that paragraph. You know, they'd say it better than we ever could. Um, a Wikipedia I feel like, page. Yeah, seriously, Wikipedia, Amazon. There's summaries everywhere. Even a lot of reviews take the time to summarize it, which. I don't know how I feel about that, but no, we're, we're, what we're going to do now is just kind of get into specific scenes. We'll assume you know the characters, and we'll assume you've read the book and have an understanding of what happens in, in the story from here. But even if you haven't read it, you might get some, some interesting moments out of it. Yeah. Shall we get into it, Charles? Yeah, the first scene was... The first one chronologically that we want to talk about is one that I picked, and... I I was reading when, on the reread. I was trying to take note of how does Sanderson explain this whole idea of allomancy to us through the narrative? Because I remembered allomancy being a very complicated, very scientific uh, magic system where everything was written out very specifically. It's like you have all these metals, you have pewter, you have tin, you have all these things and each one has its own thing and you push and pull and I was like so much detail how did he get all of this across while still I still remembered it being a really fast paced fun easy to follow thing so I was going through that with a very critical lens and I think the main scene Mm -hmm. that that kind of kicks all that off for me was this opening like in the first couple chapters after we met Kelsier he already like he already kind of messed stuff up with 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 uh noble lords out in the plantations he like killed a whole noble house and he made his way into the capital and the first thing he does pretty much when he gets there is he decides he's just gonna hit house venture hard and 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 steal their atm 
while they're not expecting an attack. You know, the first move he makes is to go right for the top house and go right for their adium stash. And that whole scene when he he flies in and he's fighting all these different kinds of people, like he's fighting the regular guards and they go down easy. And then he introduces these other guards that wear all, like have wooden shields and, and don't wear metal so that he can't, as a misborn, he can't interact with them, and you, he says things like flaring pewter, which you don't necessarily know what that means, but it sounds like he's, you know, exerting strength. So he, like, he, he just goes ahead. It's a really great example of show, don't tell, in which case he just he uses pretty much every different metal, and he's pushing and pulling, and he's he's fighting all of these guys and. I remember reading that whole thing and being like, wow, this could easily be like the opening scene to a movie or an episode in the show For or sure. something. It, it just it just flowed so well. And it also served the second purpose, maybe its main purpose when he wrote it, beyond entertaining us as readers, was to kind of clue us into how Alamancy works in action and just the extent of how powerful it is because he fights a lot of guys in that <laughs> and he he does successfully steal the atm and gets away with it so it just kind of also showed the potential of a, of a misborn's power and right away after reading that i was like this is a very quintessential misborn moment that i wanted to make sure we talked about i think that that's that, that's really well stated charles i think he I took a. I saw you put this as one that you wanted to talk about, so I reread that even after my reread. I reread wow, it. A re reread. Yeah, the first ever maybe, and I, I was trying to take notes specifically on that kind of stuff. Like, how does he get across what it does? And it seems like he he seems to slip in these little lines that you could almost barely notice them where he does a tiny bit of telling, but once he's told you, then he's assuming you know it and Mm -hmm. he's moving forward from there. Like, you know, it would be something like when he introduces tin, he might say uh, he burned tin, uh, enhancing his senses, something like that. That's what Mm -hmm. tin does. But from there, that little explanation, you're learning a lot more from the fact that he's just feeling everything more and he can feel the pebbles beneath his feet, right. I think it and, was. And in that moment, he's actively, he's in the very center of House Venture trying not to get killed also. So there's mm-hmm. stakes to the whole thing and it... it, it it just adds that sense of action and it, and it puts it in context immediately. So even if you don't fully understand it, you can kind of get a sense of what he's capable of. Mm-hmm. And I definitely have that same feeling that you have. I had it the first time I read it. I had it again this time is how amazing it is that he's able to take something that feels like it could be really complex, but I never think of it that way because it's so (laughs) well explained where you're like, okay, yeah, so burning tin, like he's going to be able to see things better. It's, you almost don't even question your understanding of it because right and even when it does get challenged it's almost like a scientific theory where people are testing new things and they achieve new Mm -hmm. things but it all is because it it still obeys the laws that we've already understood of allomancy they just figured out a new way to kind of exploit them so this is kind of setting the foundation for all of that and i just was very impressed with that scene and it's so fortunate that it happens right at the like early stages of the book this isn't even the first time kelsier raids uh nobleman's house but it is the first time we get like the play-by-play because that other one kind of happened off off screen if you will so this was the first time we really got to see the extent of his power very entertaining uh read it almost feels like a tutorial in a video game <laughs> where yeah, you exactly. get to play as the your main character that you're playing as is Vin. So you're going to have to develop the skills over time and you might not have access to all of them yet. But first you get to play as the maxed out Kelsier and you get to try out all the different stuff and learn the game mechanics. And that's a great I don't know analogy. If Sanderson nails it's so it. true. 
I would love to play that game. <laughs> yes, I would die to play a Mistborn video game. It <laughs> seems so perfect. <laughs> it does. I'm anxiously awaiting. There was going to be one, but it got canceled a few years ago. So, Such a shame. N- nothing in the works. I'm curious about, I see in the notes here, this is a scene that you picked, and I'm really curious to, to figure out what exactly pulled you to this scene. You kind of teased me with it a few days ago, so mm. I'm excited to hear your points. Well, the thing I put down was the the second ball, and that's when Vin has that intera- interaction with Shan, who's pretty much the, the mean, popular girl. And uh, there's some other stuff I'd like to talk about in this, but uh, I'll say that, and I also put slash Mistborn fight, because you'll know if you read this, that eventually the way that the Vin and Shen confrontation comes to an end is that Vin stabs her with arrows and uh, kills her in this Mistborn fight. Yeah, so she Shan's turns out to be, to be a, a full Mistborn, not just a soother also. We're talking about mm-hmm. Shan. Because Shan was yeah. built as this soother this whole time. And then mm-hmm. right at the end of their kind of arc that she... This was one of the more like interesting twists for me because I... Some of them you could say are more or less predictable, but this one was, it was an interesting one. And I thought it was a fitting end to kind of their... That whole that whole C, that whole B storyline. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it's a it's a really well played reveal that Sanderson does because they say, "Hey, it's part of court gossip. Everyone's trying to figure out what who's a misting or a mistborn." And and they mention throughout the whole book that every nobleman has mistborn, but you never mm-hmm. have seen one. So this was, the, and it's all the way at the end of the book. This is your first time seeing like a professional, like raised in nobility, misborn, and they kind of go out of their way to describe how um, she's got all the like the gear, and she's all dolled up. She's got her hair pulled back. You know, she's like very formal kind of presentation of what I guess a trained misborn would be like. So that all was really an interesting dynamic to see Vin, who was kind of like a year into being a misborn and kind of training on the streets and through the school of hard knocks to go up against kind of this more classically trained misborn was a very mm-hmm. interesting fight to see played out for sure. And the thing that, well, first off I want to say about the, it's great thinking that uh, when you find out this twist, you're like, Oh, well, of course, if everyone's trying to figure out what kind of misting people are, someone would figure out, hey, if I just make it obvious to everyone that I'm a soother, then they'll never expect that I'm an right. all-out Mistborn if that's the only power I ever right. use, but I use that one all the time. So I, I love that. But going back to the the second ball where she has interaction with Shan, I this made me think about our conversation about what we love about fantasy from the previous podcast, because mm-hmm. I, I know... Uh, we spoke a little about the Shan interaction. Neither of us is, thinks that's like amazing dialogue or is in love with that interaction. But what's amazing is this sort of mean girl dynamic that plays itself out between them that, you know, you've seen in a, a ton of different media. You get to see, rather than ending with like some moment where. I don't know, Vin embarrasses her in front of the whole <laughs> noble <laughs> people or something, like at a ball, which would be the kind right. Of or you like, you know, Vin gets the boy and she gets mm-hmm. and, sh- and, and and Sean gets kind of scorned and it's just yeah. kind of like harumphing off at the end, you know? <laughs> yeah. So in, instead of that, which, you know, there's a time and a place for it, they get to settle it in this giant aerial mistborn battle, which is super <laughs> epic. And right, she I gets feel like stabbed in the heart with an arrow shaft. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I, I like my mean girl dynamics to end with arrow shaft stabbings rather than, right. you know, embarrassment. It kind of raises ball. the stakes a little bit. It, 
It gives mm-hmm. you the it gives you the best of both worlds. It gives you Mean Girls, but it also gives you gritty action and and death. For sure, and I think it drives home the point that fantasy can, you know, it can play with all the same stuff that you see in other types of fiction, but there's ways, I think, in fantasy to just make that a little bit more, let's say, fantastic instead of better. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, that's that's a great example of just that whole mentality of this kind of social interaction brought into a fantasy sort of action setting. The parallels are really, are really interesting in that poor, poor Sean. Oh, she's like the, she's one of the most evil, maybe the most evil, like least gray characters. (laughs) Yeah. The whole thing, like more than the Lord ruler, I would say her and staff venture are probably the, the big two, but I, and another good I thing in this say, fantasy fight. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> well, this is going to change gears a little bit, but it's my biggest pet peeve or just issue, I guess, with this book, maybe this trilogy, is why does Ellen Ellen brings this totally uh, illegal, messed up book? I don't know, messed up, rebellious book. About, uh, to the balls and he tries to hide it like it's a boring book but he's just bringing it among who knows how many other books I, he's always carrying it's a book that it, if you get discovered place. with it you will get mer- you will get killed yes. executed public execution if you get caught with this book and he has he's bringing like i don't know let's say 15 books to all the balls and he just can't resist bringing the the one that would get him killed and he leaves it unattended <laughs> <laughs> like vin doesn't even know she's not even trying to look for it and she discovers it so like i i don't know what was happening there sanderson is usually so great at just plotting and not letting his characters do absolutely stupid things but yeah that one got away it's not that egregious of a thing, but I kind of felt the same way. It made me wonder, like, how truly, like, damaging is this book? You know? I mean, they have, they mention, it's not till later that they mention that book and how there could have been a pu- easily been a public execution. And now he was worried that that book was going to be used against him. And I was like, you're worried about it now versus, like, at that second ball when you just brought it nonchalantly? <laughs> like... It, it, for me, and left it, was, it unattended yeah the reframing of it later on where he was genuinely worried about it. it's like oh no if they find that i'm dead it's like you didn't feel that way earlier <laughs> um, but i guess maybe that's who knows he's him kind of growing up or something but i agree it was one of it wasn't one of the strongest moments in the book yeah and but you before know, we, we all... depart from sean's that 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 is that her name, Sean? Her her yeah. action, her fight scene. I, I do want to just mention, sometimes with fantasy fight scenes, and it happens a little bit in Mistborn, it's like it's hard to kind of write an ending to a good a good battle. But you know, sometimes it's like the hero like sees something's like they're losing and then they just oh, what's this? More power? Okay, and then they win, <laughs> you know? Or it's like, no, it's it's all we're gonna lose and now I'm sad, unleash power i didn't know i had to win but i what i liked about that fight scene was she was losing and she didn't just like discover this power within her to beat her she did this clever thing with doing like fake outs of daggers and arrow shafts and she used metal versus wood to kind of it's explained so well as is happening that she was able to kind of trick sean into focusing on pushing away a metal dagger which was a feint of the wooden arrow shaft that eventually like she stabbed her with so i just really thought that was a great ending to that fight and one of my biggest critiques of like the ending of fantasy fights sometimes is just how it's and then the character reaches into themselves and pulls out this new well of strength that they didn't have when they started the fight and and, and wins so i just really liked how that and how most of the fight scenes go in this um 
it it was all based on really interesting kind of like ac- action there's feints there's kind of tricks that people pull with allomancy like there's one moment where vin just has a cloud of of metal that she like blows into the inquisitor's faces so that they can't see her you know so it's like it's all these mm-hmm. kind of interesting twists and turns and things that what makes this hard magic system and this story like we go back to his first law where he's talking about both as a storyteller and as a reader it's uh really really thought out and it's not just some generic kind of fantasy trope which makes it that much better exactly i think she tricked shan by making it look like she ran out for atm which for those who it's been a little while since they read the book, uh, if you're burning ATM, then you can see all of what your opponent is about to do. But if your opponent's burning ATM too, it basically cancels it out because it just sends out all these weird uh, images like because things keep changing what you would do. Um, so both of them are burning ATM and then Vin makes it seem like she ran out as part of her gambit there at the end. Right. Yeah, there's so much going on in that scene that I really liked. It, it kind of mirrors, it, it's a, It's like how far we've come from Kelsier's attack on House Venture, because this is like one of the last uh, fights in the, in, the, in the book. So it's kind of interesting to see how they, how Sanderson set up the basics, the foundation in that opening Kelsey are fighting all the the guards of House Venture to now you have two full-born Mistborns kind of trying to trick each other is a really interesting way Sanderson developed he you know his whole first law is like it's it's as only as good as we the reader understand the magic system right so it's like oh wow that was really clever what she did because we know that how ATM works and we know it's just kind of the stalemate of whoever has more but then in this last battle, she uses that knowledge to trick her opponent and defeat her, which is a really amazing move on Sanderson's part. Like, it was so creative. I don't know how he thinks of all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's really amazing. Is there um, any... Uh, I, we have a couple more scenes here. Is there one you really wanted to, to mention before we move on? Well, I'll, I'll briefly mention the one I put about the... In chapter 29, where Vin has a conversation with Sezed, and she's saying, it's all going to change, isn't Mm -hmm. it? And it's basically she's just happy with the way her life looks right then. And she's actually enjoying going to the ball. She likes seeing Ellen, and she enjoys being around the crew. And she also knows that all of that is going to change because of a bunch of life circumstances that will demand it and this has been a scene that's always stuck with me a lot and I think of it all the time when I'm in moments where I feel that I mean even I'll think back to when we're in New Zealand in the hot springs in Rotorua you remember this? Right, Rotorua and Rotorua, is that how you say it? It's Maybe it's Rotorua Sorry, anyone that lives there. <laughs> yeah, it and the place you live smells great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and not like rotten eggs at all. No, it's not all those sulfur deposits. Yeah. So, the but the hot springs were an amazing time. Just you, me, and Derek, the third yeah. member of our M crew. That's and. Right. Yeah, those kind of moments where I'm like, look, we're all going to go back and none of us live near each other. Or uh, maybe I was about to move, I I think, at that point. And I remember those moments as always evoking the same feeling that that Vin is talking about here. It's like, I know that I I can't hold on to this moment, but I really wish I could just stay here forever. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. That scene is really critical. It, it also, that scene happens right before the kind of rising action of the story as well. And it comes right before the kind of big reveal of um, the Lord Ruler's true uh, identity. So the fact that Sanderson wove in not only the theme of the book of like enjoying the 
the moment that you're in and being open to new and having hope for the future but it's also kind of narratively setting up it's like stuff is about to to go down so by yeah. saying it's, it's just a really great way that great authors can kind of do multiple things at once and that's just a really great scene i'm glad you picked that moment to talk about thanks well you mentioned <laughs> themes there shall we talk that, a bit about that i said that by design yes um wow. I just really quickly because i want i'm very excited about our last segment um some of the main like themes of this book it's vin is the main character by far everyone knows that and most of the book is her going from like this kind of paranoid like fight or flight trust no one mentality into actually having friends and then ultimately falling in love and opening herself up to love which is all really great um but definitely i wanted to talk about um, trust, which is one of the things Vin struggles with throughout the whole show. When she first meets Kelsier and her his crew, she doesn't trust them all. She's like, "Oh, like he, I'll I'll try and learn as much from him as possible about these metals, but and before like I'll, I'll leave before he tries to hurt me or whatever. Or oh, they're all just using me, and then they're gonna leave." Um, and she's talking about it like this is now like she's gotten to know them all. She's She's part of the crew. She's been doing Allomancy for almost a year now. And she's talking. This is one of those times she's talking to Kelsier in the mist, like right before he mm-hmm. he kind of gives himself up. This is in chapter 32 for anyone that's reading along. And she has this moment where she says um, she's talking about trust. And she's like, that's kind of what trust is, a willful self-delusion. You have to shut out that voice that whispers about betrayal and just hope that your friends aren't going to hurt you. Distrust is really the same thing, only on the other side. And I read that, and I was like, well, that's interesting how she phrased it, where she says distrust is the same thing, but the other side, and how that kind of parallels how the push and pull of allomancy works. And I just thought it was kind of clever, like this whole book is built up around this thieving crew, and it's built around trust, and it's built around um, also allomancy, which has this duality to it. Uh, and I just thought that that was a really um, strong moment that it's like, well, there's push and pull <laughs> in all of life, and Vin's able, Vin's ability to master pull, pushing and pulling metals, and then also kind of learning how to to trust people and have hope and things and the whole story kind of as she gets stronger in both culminates with her not only defeating the lord ruler but also falling in love and i just thought that was a really interesting scene that kind of summarized that whole that whole arc for for vin's development of trust well i wrote down the same quote that you wrote <laughs> and <laughs> i was realizing when she was saying that i was kind of like uh this is this is pretty much the thesis of this yes book. i was like yeah. oh, sanderson's making a point here and the phrasing yeah. where she says it's really the same thing only on the other side when she's talking about trust and distrust so. i think the the book is about being willing to trust not because you're foolish or overly optimistic but because it's worth it and distrusting is about faith in a sense it's about having faith that people will betray you which is what Vin had before but trusting is about uh, acknowledging that uh, it's it's going to be a better life if you try to let other people in and you know hey it might it might mean getting hurt but i still want to do it because i want to be happy and have relationships and that's explored pretty directly at points where kelsey pretty much says it and then vin starts coming around to that way of thinking And the book, you can really tell it's about this because the way it ends is with Vin reflecting on the fact that uh, her brother, who 
had been built up throughout the book as the reason why she learned to distrust ended up having died protecting her, which he finds out toward the end. And then she's actually thinking about that when she makes the decision to, hey, I'm going to give this a shot and trust Ellen. And uh, the book ends with her reflecting on uh, that with about her brother and going in to try to make a relationship happen with Ellen. Right. And that was a great way to wrap it up. I thought it was, you know, kind of oh, whatever is the kind of th- almost throwaway thing with the Inquisitors like, oh, yeah, I remember your brother. He really uh, we <laughs> really tried too. to get him and he never gave you up. And that was that. Bye. <laughs> I was like, that's whatever. <laughs> that's good to know, I guess. But it, it does. It's almost kind of necessary to to frame this whole how she's come around because in the beginning of the books like super heavy on her internal monologue of her brother saying like don't trust anybody they're all gonna hurt you like anytime something bad happens he's like of course it happened everyone will leave you and then this kind of stuff and then yeah that voice gets quieted quieter and quieter throughout the book and then at the end you find out that he at least had um he at least kind of held out for her in his last few moments and protected her. So it was an interesting arc. Not there were better ones, but that one was pretty good. I mean, there's the only other theme that I'll just touch on really briefly because it's not super prominent is of religion. And I mean, in if you go to Brandon Sanderson's website, we already talked about how he has notes on every chapter and. In the, some of these chapters that are more kind of focused on the conversation of religion, he makes no qualms about it. Like, it's obviously, you know, a lot of, like, Christian elements with Kels here, like, sacrificing himself. But then it was the twist of him coming back is really just, like, another creature eating his bones and, and taking over <laughs> his body. Yeah, the Contra, yeah. So, which I thought, you know, if you're going to do a, a Christianity trope, at least you um, play with it a little bit. So um, that was interesting. And then there's just, you know, they're, they're talking about how, uh, you know, he's the, Vin and is how are we saying his name? Sade? Say Say Zed. Say Zed. Say Zed. So, so Vin and Say Zed are are talking about Kelsey or like he just died and like there's all these riots are going on the street like the Scar are rioting and are emboldened by his sacrifice and and Vin's like but we knew him he was no prophet or god he was just a man and then say Zed said so many of them are I think and which is just kind of this I it builds on that idea of hope and and trust and relationships it's like um you know this this kind of idea of hope and 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 having this almost willful self delusion of the future, which is that whole thing Vin explicitly said about trust is played into why Kelsier decided to sacrifice himself and kind of embolden the, the Scott people into a revolution. So there is that religious element. It is kind of interesting. And say Zed, you know, is the keeper of hundreds of religions and throughout the books he talk you know he talks to vin and kelsier about different religions and kind of foreshadowing what was going to happen with kelsier kelsier kept asking about one particular religion where I, I forget the name of it but it was something to do with like boats and captains and if like a boat captain died they the crew would still like worship them and respect them and that kind of idea that their death gave the crew even more meaning to go on kind of a thing, and which is basically what happened with Kelsier at the end of the book. So I just thought that was something worth bringing up. It's not as huge as the trust theme that of Vin's character development, but I just thought it was interesting. Um, it's so obviously written into the book that it's something we had to touch on. Uh-huh. He definitely has a discussion with Sezed about which religion held out longest after the Lord Ruler took over and it was one that all the leaders had been killed but they kept going Right, and yes. that was clearly foreshadowing for what ends up happening with Se- uh, with Kelsier who sacrifices himself in this giant gesture killed by the Lord Ruler and yells about how he is hope 
And yeah, it was right. uh, definitely stuff I didn't realize in the first read. Right. And, you know, I definitely was more in tune with, I was coming at this from more of like an author's intention approach than the first time where mm. I was just trying to enjoy the story. This time I was trying to understand um, Sanderson's perspective as the writer. You know, when he talks about the writer, the reader, and the storyteller, I was like, okay, what is he doing now as the writer when he's writing, when he's mentioning all of these things and kind of the dots, you can connect the dots from pretty far back into the book, which is it's such a good book it's just one of those things it's that great it, yeah it, it, he did such a great job that was it that was episode two of the friends talking fantasy podcast uh, my name is charles and with me today was dylan we thank you so much for listening to our review or our discussion i would say not really a review on miss Porn the final empire next week we're gonna just have a discussion and we will shortly after that do an episode about the second book in the series, which is that Well of Ascension? Is that book number two? Yep. Yep. So we're going to hit the books and then and, and hurry up and read that so we can talk about it in the very near future. All of this and more to look forward to in the future of the Friends Talking Fantasy podcast. Anything? For sure. Anything else to say before I bring us home? I think we should pitch our web pages and where you can reach us. Oh, yeah. Well, we don't have them, like, built yet, but we are theftfpodcast.com, and we are wherever you can listen to podcasts, or at least the ones people actually use, like um, the the Apple version and then Spotify and google play be on youtube uh we're on facebook and twitter just google us man we're we're gonna be around so google friends talking fantasy podcast and click you can follow us at on twitter at the ftf podcast one that's at the ftf podcast one that's the number one, not the word. That's the number one. one. Yes. All right. So go there, follow us, do all that stuff. Thank you for listening, and have a great day. And go forth and conquer, friends. Nailed it. Nailed it. Where's my audio? Where's Oh, it's all the way down. Hold on. <laughs> Start over. And so I'm going to turn up the volume. And go forth and conquer, friends. Thank you for listening. Both times. Nailed it twice.